bit farther and been walking around London since 10 o'clock that morning, sustaining throughout the day a sense of pride for having broken away from the Golden Acre Senior Citizen Tour group to, to venture out on her own. The afternoon light was fading when she popped into, is there a Farrell's Tea House? In, in the Farrell's Tea House on Piccadilly to observe, to, I can't read it very well, to observe and participate in the most civilized of British traditions, high tea. The hostess seated her at the back of the room next to a window at one of the ample round tables adorned with a soft white linen tablecloth, something you would find in only the most expensive restaurants at home. She smiled as she looked up at the large crystal and chandelier the scattered light into tiny orange flames all around the room, as if from a hundred candles. It gave one the feeling of being part of something bigger than oneself. Then the pain reminded her that she was isolated in a 70-year-old body that was manifesting new and more gruesome symptoms of old age daily. She had all but forgotten the dream of the night before. She rubbed her legs and sighed. What a blessing to get off her feet and relieve her 200 pound frame from that relentless pull of gravity. Her shoes felt tight from swollen feet. The varicose veins in her left leg throbbed like a time bomb ticking down and there was a strange tickling around her heart. She'd gotten a bit turned around when she strayed off on her own, wasn't sure how to get back to the hotel. She couldn't seem to remember the street or the name of the hotel. It was near the London Tower. The name would come to her soon and she would ring them up for directions. For now she would enjoy a little more time away from the group, have some tea and, and a pastry. She smiled again at the thought of what might seem to others a minor stri strike for freedom. But for Dottie, it was a milestone. She felt like a trailblazer exploring new territory, poking around in small, dark little basement shops that smelled of damp mold and mystery. She thought of herself as a somewhat timid woman who had been taught to regulate her thoughts and desires to society's standards. But she had been emboldened by the fortuitous and uplifting dreams she'd had the night before. Even though the details were mostly forgotten by Dottie, the essence of the dream lingered in, the, in her every cell as a self-evident truth. Who knows what precipitated precipitated such a bold vision from the unconscious. Perhaps she had been pushed over the edge of propriety by yesterday's mundane activities dictated by a little Hitler of a tour guide. A young woman with a shrill voice shouting orders to line up, count heads, and stay together. Dottie was tired of being rounded up like one of the sheep, prodded from one accepted tourist and tracks it to another. Yesterday, they'd gone to see the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace, the T Tower Bridge, and a rather hurried tour through the British Museum. It was at Madame Toussaint's, Toussaint's, how do you say that, Toussaint's? Madame Toussaint's, yeah. Toussaint's Wax Museum, while gawking at Marilyn Monroe's translucent, tragical, beautiful face that, uh, that Dottie's varicose veins suffered from their final assault for the day. Even before, she, before she'd had the dream, a clear and singular purple mood of conspiracy had overtaken her. She had decided to go out on her own the next day, the next and final day in London, at her own pace and on her own time. And that was that. Finally falling asleep after having soaked her swollen feet and medicating herself against the pain in her leg, she had had the dream. It was Easter Sunday and she was immersed in a landscape that she had seen on a holy card of the resurrection of Christ. She found herself in a dry desert landscape filled with boulders. A strike of lightning parted the boulders and there she stood with her hands raised to the heavens. She, Dottie McFarland, had been transfigured from the new, into the newly risen Christ. Her late husband Edgar had been a Baptist minister of the strict cloth. He had been alive if he, had he been alive, she would never have spoken of such a blasphemous dream to him. But oh my, how freeing it was to be resurrected into a new body, 
What a joy it was to feel her heart open in love to every living thing, to be the Christ if remembered only for a moment. Remember, this is going to be edited some more. So. <laughs> At the height of Dottie's ecstasy, Mrs. Dobson had knocked on her door with a rudely loud wake-up call. She was repeating the itinerary of the day on the other side of the wooden barrier in a loud, croaky voice. And after breakfast, we shall go to Har Harrods to shop and then on to the theater to catch a matinee of the mouse trap and this evening to the oldest pub in London for kidney pie and stout. She kicked forcefully against the door again. She knocked forcefully against the door again. Mrs. McFarland, do you hear me? Are you awake? Dottie wished the old frog would stop croaking and go away. I'm awake, but I won't be joining the group today. I have relatives to visit here in London. I'll see you tomorrow. That should take care of it. She found a perverse pleasure in telling Mrs. Dobson a lie. What would Christ have done? Would he have lived? Would he have lied over such a petty incident? She doubted that he would have subjected himself to indulging in kidney pie and walking all over London on a tight time schedule that allowed for only a surface glimpse of things. She was unaccustomed to tell, telling fibs. She couldn't remember what she'd done it before. She had always emphasized the importance of telling the truth to her four children, all of who were grown, who all of who were grown now, grown now, and busy with their own families. But now, after the dream, she had been fortified by a residual state of ecstasy. She had decided today she would be the star in her own play. It wasn't true that she had never told a lie before. If you want to get down to the brass tacks of it. Whenever Dottie watched movies, she had top billing as the star on the silver screen. If only for a, for a few hours. Call that a lie if you will. Her favorite movie star was Ida Lupino. Oh, Remember Ida Lupino? She's the best. She's the best. Where am I? She was a great director. Was she? She was famous for her directing, yeah. Besides Dottie him. became Ida with her darling heart-shaped face in such movies as High Sierra. While watching the movie, her eyes would become round, shiny moons like Ida's that drift with adoration for Humphrey Bogart. In her mind's eye, Dottie fashioned a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame for herself. Living in North Dakota, she had never traveled to Hollywood in her life, in real life. And it wasn't exactly true that the daydreams only lasted till the movie ended. She relived the endings at home whenever she was bored or in church when the sermon became monotonous, monotonous and too long. What does it mean to crash out? In her mind, she would ask the police officer at High Sierra in her Ida Lupino voice. Freedom, he would answer. And she would smile and pick up Pard the dog and walk into the camera whispering, freedom, freedom. And then the end. Dottie marveled at how the leading lady and man knew they were in love from the moment they looked into each other's eyes and would then sacrifice anything to be together, even their lives. She'd been married to Edgar for just shy of 50 years when he died last June. Didn't recall having felt that way about him at any time during their union. <laughs> I don't think that one's funny. The water, the waiter brought a tea and brought her tea in a white china pot, along with some flat little cakes, clotted cream, and strawberry jam. Mm -hmm. Dottie opened the teapot lid, opened the teapot lid, and leaned in to the perfumed aroma of Earl Grey, her favorite drink since being exposed to it in London. She poured a cup slathered a cake with the clotted cream and jam coming alive to her surroundings. All the tables were full now. The tea room seemed larger than when she first, she first arrived. It seemed to grow to accommodate the crowd that was dropping in for high tea. The city was rubbing off on her. This city was rubbing off on her. She found herself using British expressions, 
both in her self-talk and when speaking to others, mostly to ask directions. Would you be so kind as to direct me to the British Museum? She practiced by herself. What in England do as the English? <laughs> she couldn't shake the feeling of anticipation that something more than the obvious awaited her. She was like a Sherlock Holmes on the sleuth for something beyond appearances. They had all looked beyond the facade, hadn't they? The great religious leaders, artists, and scientists who changed the way we view the world. Not that she was a great hero or leader, but she had always prodded and poked at the surface for something more. Although she went to church and taught Sunday school, she never considered herself a religious woman not in the conventional sense. Still deep in her heart, underneath the drone of everyday life, she was for, forever preoccupied with the longing to catch fire and burn clean. May I join you? The young man was tall with long bones that seemed delicate and hollow, weightless looking, like a large seabird. He looked as if he'd been tortured, tortuously stretched on a rack. He seemed to have caught the light from the chandelier and brought it over to the table with him. He was beautiful to behold, with that dazzling orange halo that surrounded his long blonde hair. His large, his large, my glasses, his large chestnut colored eyes seemed to hold a depth of wisdom. And his whole face was lit with a smile that could melt the ice caps of the North and South Poles. Yes, there was a heat about him that, strangely enough, posed no paradox with his outer appearance of frailty. The young man was of the, the molten core of the earth, the eye of a hurricane, a tiny molecule that contained the latent possibilities of the energy of an atomic bomb. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please do sit down, she said, stunned. She had been looking for this kind of person, one who exhibited the extraordinary while operating in the milieu of the mundane. Your British accent is coming along, he said and laughed, as if he knew her. A few more weeks abroad and you would sound like the true Londoner. He winked and ordered a cup of Earl Grey tea and some cakes, just as she had done. You're from the United States, aren't you? The upper Midwest, I presume. She felt a fiery connection from her solar plexus to his. Her body was rid of pain and she felt young again. Did you know that it has just been discovered by some of our greatest scientists that electrons have the ability to occupy more, occupy more than one space at the, t the same time? Oh my, what an exciting discovery. I have felt all my life that this is somehow true. She felt her face redden. What did she know of science? She had never talked this way to anyone. I knew you were special. When I first saw you smiling here by the window by, all by yourself, he looked down at his cup and smiled. He beckoned the waiter to fill the teapots again. It was dark now. It crossed Dottie's mind only briefly that she was a stranger in a far land and she, sh she should exhibit some caution with this person. Should she excuse herself and go in search of the group? The young man covered her hand with his. It emblazoned her heart with such tenderness and joy that she almost fainted. You don't have to worry about keeping up with the group anymore, Dottie McFarland. You will be just fine. Embarrassed and not knowing how to respond to such caring, Dottie resumed the conversation about the electrons. Do you suppose there could be other dimensions in which we live simultaneously? Perhaps our electrons are sent sentient beings and carry other whole separate lives within their tiny selves apart from our lives on Earth. When I was a young girl, I had a strong feeling that I had once lived on the moon and was perhaps still living there. But oh my, how I'm running on. She felt a jolt of energy pierce her solar plexus. It was as if she'd been struck by lightning and hurled far away from the Earth, launched into outer space. She couldn't remember the nitty gritty of it all. In fact, she couldn't remember anything. The waiter found her alone at the table with the tea setting for one. The coroner determined that she'd had a sudden stroke, sudden heart attack, rather. In her purse, they found the itinerary for the Golden Acres tour, 
and the name of the hotel where they were staying in London. Dottie's body was dispensed home, dispatched home on the next flight out of Heathrow. Upon the return of her remains to her native state, her children gathered, gave her a proper Christian funeral, eulogizing her admiral traits of always volunteering herself when needed, speaking of what a good mother and wife she'd been. As Dottie's body was lowered into the gouge in the frozen ground next to her husband, Edgar, if one listened carefully, one could hear on a bitter wind the song of a woman in love. What does it mean to crash out? Freedom, freedom, the end.